last one tomorrow, actually, with uh, Louise here. Um, and as I keep saying, just like a puppy is not just for Christmas, the climate is not just for COP. Um, and it's great that there's so much media attention and so on. But I felt particularly strongly about uh, having um, an event and a discussion on this, uh, partly out of purely selfish personal reasons. I, I'm not just a, a mild mannered professor with very bad taste in, in clothes, but I'm a recovering politician and was for many years on the, the front lines in the mole hills of politics in Ards and North Down in Hollywood, where I live. I was a Green Party councillor for, for seven years. But for most of my academic career, 30 years, I've been working on green politics, issues around the climate calamity, uh, ecological issues, and suddenly I'm an overnight success after 30 years. Everyone wants to speak to me. But I've become increasingly uh, not only intemperate, uh, in this very uh, room, I think last <coughs> week, I, uh, I kind of lost it with my university in terms of not declaring a climate and ecological emergency, not really taking the climate crisis seriously. But I've also um, been very um, conscious of the limits of the rational policy, political framing of the climate crisis uh, in terms of, take your pick, the Anthropocene, that's one very popular term now, that the age of the human is what we live in. Or if you're, old, if you're an old Marxist like me, it's the Capitalocene, it's a, it's a, it's a result of the capitalist system um, and quite a lot of the mobilization you see in young people striking is around that you know wanting to blame some of the you know our generation the state or corporation and fossil fuel companies and don't get me wrong we're going to need that analysis that political analysis of what's the ultimate driver of the calamity that we're now facing but i was conscious of the fact that the the more positive creative uh, responses i mean i'm often of the view it's a wonderful book if you haven't read it probably the best book on climate change uh, by a man called mike hume and it's called why we disagree about climate change and he has a wonderful line in it where he says um, it's not what we can do for the climate that's the kind of normal often kind of enlightenment modernist very male that the problem we want to fix it so it's not what we can do for the climate and that's where some of these batshit crazy ideas of geoengineering and solar radiation management and we're going to you know, suck the carbon out of the atmosphere. We can do that with trees, actually. That's a much more objective way and has lots of other added benefits. But that idea of fixing the climate and, and thinking it's about what this moment in human history, which is unique and it's existential and it's troubling and it's frightening and it's emotional. And that's for the reason why I think we need to discuss art and so on. So it's not what we can do for the climate, according to Hume, it's what it can do for us in terms of affording us an opportunity to rethink, to remake society. And that invitation to see that um, through perhaps climate breakdown, something new can happen. So I'm a great fan of the apocalypse in its proper sense of the term. The apocalypse is a very bad rap. The apocalypse is not as we understand it in, in most the English languages, of this terrible future that Cormac McCarthy's the road. And amazing how most of our popular representations of the future are dystopian. It's Elysium. Um, it's you know the road. It's the day after tomorrow. And there's less of the Ursula Le Guin. I mean, when's, that, when's her work going to be turned into, uh, in, into films and, uh, and so on? I'm waiting for that. But there is something around this current moment about um, reflecting on what it means to be human uh, um, uh, at this particular time, and the limits of science and rational forms of analysis, it doesn't stir the soul. Now, even as a politician, I could see that. Talking about tons of carbon or sustainable development to a community group, you, yeah, <laughs> you just kind of drift off. It just doesn't connect. We need that, um, but I think too often, people feel alienated from the climate discourse because essentially it has no story. What's the narrative? What's the arc? Who are the heroes and the villains? Well, that's maybe more easy to define. Uh, and actually my own view now is that um, I've had to modify my uh, you know, youthful, enthusiastic Marxism where there were a bunch of capitalist bastards. <laughs> we need to sort them out and by the bing bada boom, it'll all be solved. I, it's now much more complicated for me in that we're all bifurcated in this. My own pension scheme for feck's sake is invested in fossil fuels. You 
know, uh, I'm wearing contact lenses made from petroleum. Most of us have our lives that are literally dripping in carbon. And it was actually through that engagement in energy politics that it came to culture. There's a wonderful Canadian research group called the Petrocultures Research Group. And it's looking at issues like petromasculinity, you know, petroleum subjectivities, that the ways in which our lives are, you know, literally powered by fossil fuels, you know, how, you know, things in a simple way like the, the popular road movie that, you know, America gave the world, but that's absolutely based on this energy source. You know, the heroism of that bad politics, but not a bad actor sometimes, Mark Wahlberg, uh, in terms of that film about the, the oil rig being destroyed in the Gulf of Mexico, the kind of heroism of the oil workers and so on. So it was true with exposure to oil um, that I became interested in, in culture because um, the only way I can get my cultural fix, because I'm just a sad, busy, over busy person, is poetry. Because it's a quick way of, of, of getting um, you know, away to somewhere else. And, and I found that actually, you know, the, the academic <coughs> scientific way in which we're trying to portray the climate crisis, uh, which is getting worse, and I, I, I've had all my low expectations met in COP26 in terms of what would not come out of that. But we do need a story, we need a narrative, we need something that connects with people's hearts as well as their cognitive abilities, as a prelude, in my view, to connect with the hand, the action. You know, um, if you look at any revolution, any great social change, there was always an effervescent cultural dimension to it. And there are aspects of the climate and, and green politics transition that does have our artistic mm -hmm. expressions. Um, as I say, in the popular imaginary, they're mostly American apocalyptic Hollywood uh, films and so on, which I don't think is particularly positive. But there's something about um, the creative which connects also to an essential element of what I think the transition to a less sustainable society would involve, and that's a, a revival of our democratic culture. Because I think the climate crisis is a crisis of culture, and it's also a crisis of democracy. And there was a reason why Plato, that dead white guy of uh, Western political thought, that well-known anti-democrat, he vanished in his um, famous story of the Republic, his, his image of the perfect world. He vanished the poets because you couldn't control them. And that's exactly what I, I think we need at this moment, is that uncontrollability, um, that, that aesthetic exuberance that may uh, release either a connection that we haven't made or actually just gives a bloody good song that we can march to when we're doing our climate marches as we did last uh, Saturday. So for me, I'm not particularly uh, creative or artistic in, in, in that way. I'm not even a good gardener. I've been a touch since the you know, guy, even though I'm a, a green and, and, and so on. But I recognize that we, there hasn't been the same attention to uh, the multiple ways in which, whether it's creative art, fiction, drama, uh, and so on, fantastic installations that were outside uh, the Lanyon building today that Anna will talk about in a moment, of ways of connecting with uh, particularly ordinary people because they feel let down. And this is partly my, uh, my worry, is that there, there's, a, there's a, a strong whiff of populism about these days. And it's partly fueled by a sense that ordinary people feel spoken down to by woke male privileged professors, telling them what they can and can't do. And there's a real danger that if green politics and the, the, the climate transition is presented uh, in that way, it will be resisted. We've already seen this in France with the Gilets Jaunes, the, the Yellow Vest movement was a, 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 a rebellion by ordinary French citizens who said, why Emmanuel Macron are you loading us now with a diesel tax uh, without providing us with any mitigating compensation, there's no investment in public transportation and so on. And I fear that down south where they've imposed a carbon tax now, we may see something similar. I'm not saying art can solve this. I'm not so naive to, you know, kind of Brechtian, you know, we kind of propagandize, we, art is always about trying to, you know, get home a, a political point, although as an old Marxist, I'm not against that either, in terms of a bit of an agitprop is always 
and useful, apart from the fact that I've always been the view um, that politics is theatre for ugly people, uh, and people forget about the theatricality of politics. You know, it was never more clear to me when I was a councillor myself, and to see there was a script. I could even identify certain tropes and characters in the persona that I could see unfolding uh, before me. It's even in things like if you watch you know, British politics, and you just had it, it, of the ritual of the Chancellor of the Exchequer with the red box standing outside. You know, you know, there's a kind of a scripted theatrical um, element to it. Um, but I do think, ju just to, to wind up, and I was welcome Ali and Anna in a moment, is that at this moment of existential crisis, I, I won't you know, um, <coughs> try and you know, put lipstick on a pig here, we are facing a really, really challenging couple of decades. You know, the science is pretty, pretty scary if you look at the direction of travel that we're going. As I said in a, in a previous meeting, when I, I, I'm teaching this stuff with students now, well, A, for the first time ever, I've put trigger warnings on my modules, where I've, I've alerted students to say, listen, some of the things we're discussing here are going to be quite disturbing. And so monitor and watch your own emotional um, reaction. But also, I, I'm rather joking, I think it's a bad joke. I say, listen, if, you, if you're gonna study with me, you need three things. A holy book of your choice, a razor blade, or a good bottle of Bushmills. Because if you are not, at some point, despairing and depressed, you're not reacting to it in the way that you probably should. So I do think art helps us navigate, for those of you who know, just a Kubler-Ross cycle of emotional reaction. When, you, when, we, when we're facing something really, really challenging and shocking, it's usually a bereavement or a death, or in this case, you know, uh, um, the creation of an uninhabitable earth in this coming um, century. It's shock, then it's denial, then it's depression, then it's some sort of resolution, and then you integrate uh, a, a, a response. I think art can help us with that. You know, that's why I'm a great fan, I mentioned her already, Ursula Gwynn, but there are other fantastic, oh, many um, female authors who are writing these you know, pictures, paintings of, of, of what the future might be. Because often that's what's lacking in particularly oppositional movements. We know what we're against. We're against fracking. Um, okay, well, what's your alternative then for this community who is poor and, uh, you know, what the options are? So I think art is, is you know, is, is this invitation then to try and think of uh, new ways in which we can reimagine our, our world because, and it's a phrase I think I said to you, every event we put on trees at, the, at, at these things, you know, why is it easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism? What is it about the failure of our creativity? Particularly the young people that I teach in rooms like this, who all they've ever known is this neoliberal, global, capitalist system, and they look at you with two heads when you say, well, it wasn't always like this, kids. There was a time we didn't have to pay for education. We had a decent NHS system. There was a thing called socialism. No, 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 not Soviet-style communism and so on. They immediately go there, and it's, really disheartening to see young people who are so cauterized of any creative opportunities. Um, as I was saying in the previous meeting, Elon Fekin Musk is given more airtime and credibility on the news about <coughs> colonizing Mars, and people like me or others saying, you know what, maybe we should change capitalism. <laughs> we're seen as the, the weirdos, we're seen as the ones who are naive and utopian, not Elon Musk with his dreams of colonizing Mars, and it just shows you what a strange place we are as a culture, that we're almost trapped in uh, an ever-descending uh, circle of hell in terms of there's no way out. And I think that's, again, where the disruptive of, 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 of art can come in to kind of shake us up, or at least you know, point the possibility of something um, different. So that's the confessional over. Uh, bless me for I have sinned, uh, speaking of the, uh, my usual good Catholic self. Um, so, that's me, Don, and you're all very welcome. And I'd like you to introduce, uh, I'd like you to welcome, first of all, Ali Fitzgibbon, who's going to give us a presentation. And then, at the very last minute, we have Anna Lecky, who came in. We, this has been the, the comedy of errors for this session, in terms of so many people having to drop out and so on. Um, so I'm delighted that Ali and Anna are here with us tonight, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. So, can you all give them a warm welcome? Thank <laughs> you.
the big reveal. Okay, so, um, yeah, thank you, John. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about what Art is going to do. Um, well, I might do a little bit. But what I wanted to talk about was from the research that I do, which is particularly looking at labour and looking at how people work within the art sector, I wanted to talk about the effect of capitalism in art and culture's response to the climate crisis. So it's not really about saying that art's going to save the, save the world or do something. It's actually going to say all the reasons why it can't currently unless it changes. So this is kind of, I, I feel like I'm going to kind of pour a lot of kind of negativity into it, but it's not all bad. So the first thing we have to kind of talk about is like when we talk about art and culture, what is it we actually are talking about? And the reason I kind of talk about this is that it is never one thing. It is this non-homogenous entity. It is as fractured and diffused as we can possibly imagine. So everybody's version of what they talk about, you know, John says we're talking about poetry and Ursula Le Guin. I, when I think of art, very often think about live arts because that's my background. It's kind of events, theatre, dance. Other people will instinctively go towards kind of visual arts based kind of installation stuff, and other people will be looking at street art. And all of these different <coughs> entities have these, uh, <coughs> these kind of challenges to face when we talk about climate crisis. So a museum will be worried about how it's going to actually work on things like climate control and the preservation of artifacts, objects, paintings, things like that, in light of the kind of global kind of energy crisis that we're facing into. But they're also looking at things like the repatriation of goods. So they're mainly looking one direction. They're also looking at things like the movement of mass exhibitions. They're looking at the use of panels and displays, the material goods that they have used as the default setting for how a museum functions. When you switch to something like dance, you are looking at the use of large groups of kind of migrant workforces, the vast majority of some little known fact, the entire dance industry of Ireland, of the island, is not, is not able to operate if it does not involve imported migrant labor forces in the form of dancers. And why is that? Because there is no third level training for dance in, in Ireland or in Northern Ireland. There is barely any kind of vocational training. Therefore, very few dance companies can sustain a permanent base of artists because they, all, they have to dance in order to be dancers. So we have a kind of a sustainability issue that's going <coughs> in a different direction. You also have things like lighting, you know, the mass change of kind of large power cans into LED lights. So these are all quite functional things. But then on another level, we have what I would call the financialization, the economization of practices of arts and culture that are designed to facilitate. So community-based practice, youth practice, socially engaged practice increasingly have been turned into systems of service for the community. So we end up thinking about and talking about arts and culture in service to society rather than part of society. And the reason I include this image here, which is a quilt section, it's not one of mine, it's because um, I'm a quilter, so my creative output is quilting. I don't make it, I don't, I don't make it for other people, I make, don't sell it. I make it because I like making it. And that whole sense of arts and culture being an act of creative endeavor that is in pursuit of itself and de-economized is something that I think is a, is a bit of the sustainability discussion that doesn't come up often enough. And I'm not going to talk about it terribly much because I research labour. I don't research unpaid labour in the sense of amateur, which means to love doing something purely for the love of it. I'm not really researching volunteers. I'm researching <coughs> people who want to make a living from doing things in the arts and cultural sphere. So that's the first thing, it's not just one thing. So when we think about it, we actually have to instantly grapple with a messiness and a complexity. And artistic organizations tend not to be uniform. They tend not to sit in any one sphere. They might at any one point in time be running visual art exhibitions, making films, staging theater productions, developing youth projects, running training. And increasingly, the expectation is that they will develop a form of sustainability but that is generally talked about as economic. Mm -hmm. So it's about making money from doing such things like working in communities. And this is problematic from my point of view. The other thing I would say is that the solutions is that there's no one thing. So back at the start of the pandemic, I did a talk which was called No One Thing, which was all about the fact that no one thing fixes the problems. We're gonna come back to that. But part of me, 
thinks that there's another problem, which is the external version of what we think about when we think about arts and culture, is people seeing this idea of the service. And I think, with respect to John, the Green Movement is one of the worst criminals. The Green Movement, and to a certain extent the trade union movement, has been guilty of thinking of artists and art and culture as the delivery mechanism for its own form of advertising. Mm -hmm. And that, my dear, is a form of exploitation. It is unsustainable. So actually, one of the major problems with arts and culture sitting within a green movement is it's constantly turned into the performative and not the solution finder, not the partner, not the person who's going to actually help to solve the problems. And what I do think art and culture offer is this sense of creating for the creative sake. The idea of the de-economized space is actually something extremely powerful that isn't being used sufficiently. It's not that it's not happening. It's not being recognized and used sufficiently within these kinds of discussions. And that's problematic. But, there's a big but in this. So there could be good things that come from arts and culture, but for me, there are also what Brint calls the wicked problems. So the dark and nasty secrets that are not easy to fix about arts and culture, which is that in and of itself, this is profoundly unsustainable in its current form. And part of that is the result of capitalism, part of that is the result of neoliberalism, and part of that is inbuilt habits and norms. And I research ethics of the cultural industries as well, so these norms that are built into the industry about the way we, we behave and the way we establish success and think about achievement is profoundly unsustainable. So there are a number of things that go on. One is, it's entirely built on free labor. It's built on precarious labor. It's built on unpaid internships. It's built on low wages. Theatre World in the UK has 85% of its workforce is freelance. Therefore, during the pandemic, 85% of an industry disappeared. They ceased to have a, a livelihood overnight, which then they are now being asked to pick up again. And the answer to that is, because I'm working on a free lunches and theatre project, is no, we're not coming back. We've all actually been at home, we had to find alternative ways of earning a living during the pandemic, and for many people, including people that I've interviewed, who've been on the road, solid for two and a half years, spending never more than three weeks at home, they don't want to do it anymore. They want to see their children grow up. They want to actually get up in their own bed. And if they go on the road, they want to earn enough money that they can afford to get a mortgage. So these are all kind of quite basic things that we think about. And I know that this is not the same kind of precarity as people working in the migrant workforce is working in the hospitality sector. It is not the same kind of precarity that we're seeing with people on really appalling, you know, social care contracts, the likes of which Bev Skeggs is writing about. But there is a really fundamental problem with precarity in the cultural sector, which is nobody believes it's really happening because nobody believes that people who work in the artists, and particularly artists, are real workers. And that also includes the trade union movements. So there is no one thing in the art sector, but there's also no one trade union that represents the interests of freelancers as workers. And if the vast majority of the people working in the industry are freelance, they are unrepresented, they are invisible, they are de cooperatized and they are left to fend for themselves. So there's this inbuilt system, on top of which very often most of the countries in the world that have state funding systems actually expect a system in which it will constantly seek to produce more useful service to society for less and less money. And that pushes precarity even further because the entire system is sitting on an expectation that there will be a freelance workforce that is always ready and willing to work. And that is baseline exploitation by state bodies, by government departments. Every time a government minister turns up to shake a hand at the opening of a show or an exhibition, what they're doing is shaking the hand to accept that somebody has worked for free or very little money and has given up putting their child to bed in order for this to happen. So this is a dark, dark secret. Then we get to the norms of the business. So the systemic, I told you this is like wicked problems. <laughs> I hear everybody going, oh, oh so. So systemic sustainability, there are certain elements of the industry beyond the structures of public subsidy 
that are also about a profound inability to reconcile itself with the, this idea of this happy, happy, kind of happy society that's doing this. There's a tendency to see the arts as it's, been, it's good for society. It is good for the plant. It is good that we are having this kind of arts and cultural thing. It's the fourth pillar of sustainable development, yada, yada, yada. The problem is that most of it is based on versions of success that require international status. And this creates a kind of a weird anomaly that you cannot get state funding if you're not seen to be of national or international standing. And you cannot do that if you do not start to travel, to tour, to sell your work abroad and to perpetuate systems of global travel that are unsustainable. Flip that to processes of regeneration, creative cities, the development of, kind of high level kind of mass planning that's looking at culture as a form of regeneration, as a driver for tourism in order to rebuild economies post recession. And what you get is a double whammy. Not only do all the cultural workers have to export, everybody has to be trying to import people. So the concept of the exclusive, one night only, in the city, for one night only, come and buy a premium ticket, come and stay in a hotel. All of this cultural delivery is profoundly and systemically unsustainable. And the arts and cultural sector has not reconciled itself to its own unsustainability. So not a single artistic organization can really genuinely stand up and put out some kind of message for green movements unless they are profoundly willing to address their own contribution to this bigger cultural unsustainability. So, nasty, nasty, nasty. The third nasty problem, and this is, you know, in the wake of Black Lives Matter and all kinds of things, we surely know by now that when we talk about culture, we generally are talking about a westernized version of culture which has excluded and diminished and deprofessionalized entire swathes of culture from every part of the world that is not white, that is not Western, and that is not predominantly English speaking. Our very platform, yesterday we had a talk by David Arditi online, talking about the music industry, and in the course of the conversation we discussed the fact that Jamaican artists, Jamaican music artists, my colleague Kim Ray Spence, who researches Jamaican music industry, said something that I didn't know which is you couldn't actually join Spotify if you lived in Jamaica. So who's going to listen to Jamaican music artists on Spotify if nobody from Jamaica can be on Spotify? And how does that affect our algorithms? So we are the entire system is reinforcing a form of bias mm -hmm. that privileges westernized cultures repeatedly. And we as an arts and culture sphere, and I say we because I worked in it for 25 years before I started research, we are contributing to that by failing to step back and give space. And the more we take our shows in the road, and the more we export our, our, our models of business, and our systems of doing things, if you look at the Hay Festival franchise around the world, if you look at the rebuilding of the Guggenheim and the Tates, the different you know, satellite museums in other cities, if you look at the mass export of our cultural consultants, Western European people, being kind of floated into other countries, in Brazil, in Argentina, to teach people how to do good cultural programs, to teach people how to develop what they call sustainable business models, we are guilty. We are profoundly guilty. And we are in missing the biggest, biggest trick, which is that most of the cultures in which we are trying to engage with have already developed hugely complex, sustainable, cultural ecosystems, and yes, they have problems, and yes, they're not properly paid, and they have all the same problems we have, but many of them are dealing with it in a much more sustainable way, and we're not seeing that as an exchange. Next Monday, Rafael Ahensa and Federico Escobar, who are two kind of researchers in this field, will be giving a talk on international global cultural management, and part of what it is talking about is the outworkings of a book that they spent five years working on which is just about that. How do we shift that power balance? How do we actually start seeing knowledge as an exchange and not as a one-way street in which we impose our version of what's excellent onto another culture? So three fairly major, wide-sweeping problems. No industry is clean, but arts and cultural, cultural industries are absolutely profoundly dirty and wicked on some level. So, <laughs> moving on, <laughs> I 
having just eviscerated the entire arts and culture world, of course, the whole reason I do this is because I believe it has the power to do something really, really amazing. And what we saw during the pandemic was that freelancers, when they were left with no support, nothing happening, no sign of when this would ever return, the first thing they did was not protect themselves, but start to help each other. Which gives profound hope, in my view, that actually the first thing that we actually need to start looking at is how do we look at alternative systems? How do we refuse some of the systems of industry, some of the norms that we've adopted within arts and culture? We pride ourselves in thinking of ourselves as this kind of liberal kind of industry that's not quite like big business. But actually, when we, you know, if we listen to kind of somebody like uh, Marlon James, the author, the winner of the Booker Prize, you know, the problem with being a progressive liberal is you have to remember to keep progressing. So how do we keep moving? And there are a number of ways we can think about that. One of the major challenges I feel is that whenever we talk about diminishing our international footprint, so whenever we talk about losing international status and changing, people freak out because they say, but well, we don't want to be, we don't want to be kind of local, we don't want to become parochial, we don't want to get trapped in our communities. And as an island economy, as an all-island economy, off the edge of another all-island economy with rising sea levels, we are very, very likely to see ourselves restricted quite considerably in our ability to move. And unless we reconcile ourselves to that, we're actually going to find it even harder. So we have to find alternative methods for global exchange that allow us to move in a different way and allow us to relocalize and think of how we create sustainable cultural economies, not just for the communities, but for the artists, the freelancers, the workers of the arts and cultural sector as citizens within that community and within that society. And last summer, I was part of a series of talks about the Irish festivals sector, an all island discussion about what the press was going to do in the pandemic and how are we going to think about sustainable recovery and when will we ever reopen? And one of the things that was emerging across Europe was this idea of a slow festival. So we know about the slow food movement, the idea of appreciating, about moving towards seasonality, and so much of the festival world has been starting to, you know, the festivals, the Edinburgh Festivals Network had started a number of years ago looking at creating carbon movement, of how could they decarbonize these mass festivals, which of their nature are gathering points. They bring people together. How can you do that in a way that's more sustainable? And they said very simply, we started embracing our festivals as slower places where we shared. So they brought local artistic communities together with local communities, and then they looked at those artists that they brought to them as being collaborators, not just one night only. So instead of somebody coming for two days, they came for three weeks. Or instead of they coming for three weeks, they came for six weeks and they traveled around the local area. And these are big, big changes. But actually, slow festivals, slow touring is a really good concept that we all need to start thinking about and start buying into. Um, a piece I wrote for the stage just around the time I was starting my PhD back in 2015 was about the idea of well, what would happen if we actually started to apply fair trade principles to systems of cultural production. So if we looked at professional theatre and started saying, okay, from, from seed to, to supermarket shelf, or from, you know, I don't know, from high school to through to the end of career, how do we create a system that is actually investing in sustainable livable working lives, where people can return things to communities. The evidence suggests that people working in the culture, cultural sector volunteer substantially. They are more likely to be involved actively in other movements. People who participate in arts and cultural activity are more likely to be involved in other forms of voluntary activity. So there's something that it does about civic engagement, but we're still not seeing people working in the cultural sector as real workers. So this might be a possible solution. And one of the things, and I'm borrowing heavily from Mark Banks, who's written quite a lot on the de-economizing, you know, how do you de-economize a cultural sector where everything is perpetually about the economic growth? And Mark Banks gave a talk in Leicester a couple of years back where he said, is the future that we want, is the cultural future that we want for something where we're trapped behind a headset and cut off from our fellow human beings? And his answer was, 
Well, if we start thinking about, you know, th this is being presented as the future of the creative industries. It is the digital solution that will fix all these problems of touring and traveling. And, you know, it'll make it more efficient, it'll make it less labor intensive, it'll make it more cost effective. The question is, at what price is this inefficiency? What is the cost of the plastics? What is the cost of the loss of human labor? What is the cost of the loss of creativity, of somebody coming up with a new way of doing things? I'm not saying it's not wonderful. I love the old stuff. But it's not the only solution. It is not the silver bullet that fixes the cultural sector's problems, nor is it necessarily what we should really be thinking about as the future of culture or the only future of culture. So Mark Banks is quite interesting because his, his pushback against this is that this is essentially a unit to try to force us into forms of efficient consumerism and not an expression of cultural identity or cultural narrative. And the last point, last week Oliver Jeffers was at something I was at and he was on his way over to COP26 and he was putting in an installation and we've seen at various points throughout COP26 these beautiful installations, people putting carrying trees down the road and you know we've seen the melting iceberg outside one of the galleries in London last year, we've seen apps created that talk about artists speaking about climate crisis and that's fine. But at what point do artists get to sit at the tables to come up with solutions? At what point do we actually say, if Da Vinci could come up with a helicopter before an engineer did, because that's what we believe. I'm not saying that all artists are engineers, and Disney used to coin the term the Imagineer, which a lot of artists say in love. But surely there is a way that we can think about, a different way of thinking about the solutions. There's a different way of thinking about how we gather around tables. Um, Rebecca Atkinson Lord, the stage director, said ultimately when we come down to it, most of our cultural experiences, telling stories, the oral tradition, poetry, song, theatre, all get down to us all sitting in the dark around the fire, mm -hmm. trying to keep ourselves together. So what is it that we actually essentially do as artists that is useful in trying to come up with alternative systems of of living, of working, of constructing kind of mutual, cooperative societies. How are we doing that? And how do we actually, instead of saying we want a seat at the table, how does art actually help us build an entirely different kind of table? Yes. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> like an old-style preacher, you preach the, the negativity and then ah. take us home with some positivity. So next we have Anna. Now, would you like me to put on your... Yeah, we slide. Uh, Mine's entirely different, but very academic. <laughs> that's very academic? Yeah, mine's great. Mine's just about me. <laughs> <laughs> shoebox about this size that I still haven't grown up even though I'm not plastic free anymore and like that can't go to the bin because that was my that was my plan so it's under my bed in the tiny house 
Um, and during that year, I set up Puka Warriors, which is a little kids club where every month I would learn something new so well that I could teach a six-year-old. So we learned about the bees and the forests and rewilding, and we talked about plastic, and the kids came up with these ideas um, whenever I was researching uh, sort of how plastic is recycled, that these black conveyor belts that they have in the recycling centres aren't very good at picking up black plastic. And I was talking to the seven-year-olds about like, well, not all the black plastic actually isn't properly being recycled because the robots can't pick it up. And they were like, well, why are we using a conveyor belt not colour? Like, that would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, the kids have the answers and they're not old enough yet. So, um, yeah, so then after 2019, uh, obviously we hit the pandemic and it became very hard to be plastic free. Um, and just like personal circumstances, I decided to live by myself and to do that as a freelancer again now with no chances of a mortgage and not really wanting a mortgage, I decided to buy a glamping pod and live in it full time. Um, so I've been doing that for about a year and three months now and it's going pretty well. Um, it gets a little bit colder in the winter, not gonna lie. The insulation could be improved a tiny bit, but um, but yeah, I've got everything I need in 14 and a half square meters. And my plan is to set up a tiny house community in Northern Ireland. So, that's what I'm working on. It's just been registered as a social enterprise, but I put too many plates spinning, so sometimes they have to get set down as well to make them up again. So the plan is to get the city council, if you're listening, to give me some land, <laughs> and, um, and I will uh, I will do what I can to build a community of people that live small. Um, and yeah, and then most recently, um, I uh, was the winner with my theatre company to do the installation that was just outside. Um, so this is just tiny living because whenever I say I live in a pod, people are always like, what? And uh, I was uh, obsessed with YouTube videos because I've been down all those YouTube rabbit holes of tiny house living. And my thing was always like, where do they keep their socks? So my socks are in here. Because um, <laughs> I'm always just so interested in where people put things. And this, it doesn't look like this anymore because I have a cat and a dog and 12 chickens. Um, so the bed has now been made out of kitchen cupboards. So as my dog can sleep under, underneath it, and so my cat can sleep on the bed and not touch the floor because the floor is lava when he's got a eight month old puppy. <laughs> and these are some shows that we've been doing recently. So in 2019, whenever I was living plastic free, I um, wanted to make sustainability sexy. That was my plan because mm -hmm. uh, the whole like eco Christmas present idea was just around coming out. And um, well, people were more interested in it. And again, it's like, what you were saying about COP isn't just, or kind of isn't just for COP, it's about trying to make it more integrated into everything that we do. So we ran Rewilding Winter Cabaret, um, which was funded by the Graffiti for a Bit in Arts and Business and in collaboration with Tumble Circus. So we had some brilliant um, circus acts that were just fabulous circus acts. And then we also had a drag queen and some slow fashion and a burlesque, a burlesque dancer talking about deforestation. Um, and what else did we have? We just had like loads of different things about trying to make sustainability fun mm -hmm. um, and to get people together and there was like a little vegan a vegan dinner that we could have out there and then most recently uh, during part of the summer in the Eastside Arts Festival we were commissioned to come up with a project for uh, Translink's new hydrogen powered bus they have three hydrogen powered buses in their fleet at the moment um, so we came up with a simple journey and we used headphones a lot and it was the easiest way for us to um, to tell a story and to create opportunities for other artists. So we had three writer actors that all wrote their stories and the audience sat on the bus with them. The bus didn't go anywhere, but we had an eco-friendly bubble machine outside. So if bubbles flew past as if the bus was moving. And you just listened to these thoughts and feelings that people had whenever they were looking out the window of a bus. So it was quite simple um, and trying to encourage people to slow down and to take public transport. Um, so that was that. And then this is that sinking feeling. So this is our most recent project. Um, so whenever we, whenever I saw the commission come out, it was uh, we sent out to a few people um, a ridiculously tight budget and or tight timeline. The budget wasn't too bad, but the timeline was pretty tight. Um, so I have been doing some immersive training recently. So one of the trainings that I undertook was in the Escapade HQ, which is an escape room in Dundonald. I love escape rooms. If you haven't done them, you have to do them. They're so much fun. And we got our team into this escape room and one of them was PPE themed and you unlock all the boxes and then eventually got into this PPE tank and whenever you stood on it, the water started to rise. So obviously the panic sinks in and you've got to find the key and you've got to get wet, but you don't get wet because it's magic. Um, so I was thinking about what we could do that would be personal for the planet and try to make people think. 
Um, because especially here in Northern Ireland, I feel like we're so removed from it. Like we don't have the hurricanes, we don't have the wildfires. We live in this little bubble. Um, it's like our little Goldilocks land, and it's it's not there. It's not right in front of us all the time. So I wanted to make something that was immersive and made it scary. That wasn't um, that wasn't digital because digital just isn't what what I do. I like to make physical experiences. Before COVID, we um, we had a show called Mouth of the North, and the week before we knew that there was a pandemic, I had like 30 people in a lift in the Mac, and I like, loved the people coming out of the lift and not knowing which corner they were going to turn. Like, that's the sort of stuff that I, um, like those little like, oh gosh, didn't know where we were going. Those moments are what I, I live for. So yeah, so I wanted to create something that I could have a personal experience with. Um, so I wrote a poem, and I got Phoebe Richards in to do the sound design. And we now have a working box. We did not have a working box last week, but we have a working box now. Um, and there's a pressure pad at the bottom, so when you stand in it, a blue light comes on and the water starts to fill up. Because by 2100, if things don't change, we'll be one meter um, higher of sea level, which I know is not technically Belfast so will be one meter underwater. That's the diplomatic narrative. That's what we went for. Um, so yeah, so these are the artists that are involved, SKHG artists that we did all the artwork. And the paint on the outside of the box is actually CO2 absorbing, which is pretty cool. Um, and we spoke to the yes, yes, we took the team and then Kiki Richardson did the composition and the sound design. Um, so that's really all I have to say. So I thought for the last couple of minutes I would play my poem for you. So it's like the sound design. So we have some some art. So the next, yeah, it's this picture kind of is what you'd imagine or you can just close your eyes and listen to the sound design. Um, right through us, by the docks, the waves and land meet. This is Belfast, the city water made. Hard work, big dreams connecting us to other places. The water put us on the map and we're oh so proud of that. This is Belfast, are we Goldilocks land? Not too hot and not too cold, not too affected by climate change, so we just get on as we always have. Driving about on these streets, cutting down the trees, extracting from the land using unrecyclable materials, using pesticides, killing bees, creating waste, wildlife disappearing, unleashing fumes, tearing out nature to build concrete jungles. And you know those big hills surrounding our city? They trap in all the fumes. We breathe that in. After London, Belfast is the UK spot with the most pollution in the air. But we can't see it, so we don't seem to care. Because climate change is something that happens far away. Wildfires in Australia, hurricanes in America, cyclones in Fiji. And isn't it awful about the Amazon? Here, we think we do our bit. Plastic straws are hard to find and we recycle day to day. We're in a lucky spot right here. No hurricanes, no wildfires. We still have four seasons a year. Warm weather though is a wake up call. October days at 20 degrees, leaving autumn leaves confused about whether to fall from the trees. Little Belfast built on water won't always look like this. The lion's tides will burst her banks. The city will overflow. The water we relied on flooding mountains, drowning homes. As tides move in and the water rises, we'll have no place to go. And it's the children who are shouting, not the grown-ups in control, because the generation that's affected is not the one stockpiling coal. Conversations are happening that you and I don't hear. We don't know what they're saying behind closed doors as we sleepwalk into this disaster. But when they do speak, it doesn't seem to reassure our fear. Maybe one day we'll give Sydney bypass to the sirens and sail it on to mermaids, as it's a fantasy we're living in if we think we can stop these waves by doing the fair living. Taking radical action now is the only way to change our fate. 
there is no time to hesitate. Let's rewild our countryside, bring back more bees, switch everything to renewables, insulate our homes, build a circular economy. No more waste, no more fumes, no more extracting from the land, no more plastic, no more traffic, car parks, a thing of the past. Vertical gardens are our future. Green cities, healthy cities, fresh water down the towpath, rooftop forests, clean air. And we can get there, but not if we leave it too late. The next 10 years decide, are we city's fate? We need to work together, the citizens of this land, yes, those in power have much more to do, but the future generations do depend on you. This is Belfast, the city water made. The water put us on the map, so let's stand together and not shrink back. It's scary, but it's true. These streets soon to be entirely submerged. A million trees is not enough. Belfast, what are you going to do? chat now so maybe just say who we are when we uh, ask a question or make a comment so over to yourselves <laughs> yeah, um, so how do you think we are in this time for a period of climate change and how do you think we are on Friday to go to a short story poem money for the arts mm. and then we could we could do some of that stuff I think and like I like what you said about like having the artists at the table like I think the disruptors being the disruptors and having the the different ideas um I think we're more valuable than we think we are and I think having mm. us in rooms with mm. the politicians even if we might, might not understand the jargon I think it's important to have us there because I think we can we can think differently with our a lot of our neurodiversity, I think, is valuable there. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's if it's more plays about that. I think yeah, like it could be more plays. It could be more like theatre's my world. So that's what I'm gonna think about. But I think it's it's a whole cultural shift. Would you like for for the primary schools and teachers to show them and play that that poem? Especially on top of the day. Yeah, <laughs> like maybe I'd like to. But I think working with the kids, like doing the Eco Warriors anyway with the kids, like for the whole year, like they they know. Do you know, like they know, yeah. they know more of recycling than we do. Like and I think it's like there's a part of me that wants to protect them. That's yeah. like I'm I'm just kinda Yeah, like they, they already know. Like I had like six kids throughout the last couple of days in the box and they're not even heavy enough to make the pressure <laughs> switch go. And they 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 know it, you know, they're not they're not fully scared of it because they know and I think they're like your rope and it's still here hold this final anxiety. <laughs> um so I don't I don't know, yeah, I'd like like I'd like I just I'd love more people to experience the, the sinking feeling and stuff, but um I'd rather get the politicians in the box, like I'd rather get the yeah. the ones that can make the change that are gonna change those children's lives, that's what I'd rather. Ooh, I probably shouted them for a long time, and then after that, mm. maybe just that it can all be done differently, you know. And I think, like, even what you were saying about like the creativity industry and like our theatre industry and how it's all like there's these like processes that we all go through. Like, I don't understand why the arts council is the way the arts council is, or like those things are, because like if we're so creative, like why don't we why don't we do things differently? Like we don't need to have like the structures all the time. So I don't know. I just. Yeah, I suppose my, my, my feeling is that 
artists of all types have been writing about problems with the planet for, you know, mm -hmm. since the dawn of time, mm -hmm. they have been pointing to the problems, you know, and the, you know, kind of something like Aldous Huxley, mm -hmm. Brave New World spring to mind, you know, just, you know, the annihilation of, of any semblance of humanity by its own failure. I mean, if you think that somebody was writing this book in the 1930s and you hadn't actually read it properly yet to understand that, that it wasn't a fiction, it was the potential future reality. It's kind of, to me, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, yes, yes, that's fine, but actually I think that now we are at a point where arts and cultural industries and all of the virtue signaling of fashion and things like that actually have to start shifting gear to behave as if there was a climate crisis happening. So things like, I, I find it really problematic to deliver programs uh, in such a way that there is an expectation that there are printed brochures that will mm. still produce leaflets. Mm -hmm. I find it hugely problematic that we are privileging and platforming and live streaming without thinking about super servers and where they're located. I think it's deeply problematic that we keep on privileging uh, international standard as the kind of the gold standard of how we think of success without thinking about the people who are sitting in our streets, who are the ones who are out working in schools, who are out delivering and doing original work. And what I find quite interesting is also we're talking about we're talking about arts and culture, and it's not necessarily about the delivery of the poem and the song and the book. That's really important. I mean. I live with a writer, so I know that books are important. But some part of me thinks that we are, we've got lost in thinking about the creative process as in and of itself of value. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't remember, somebody from the IMS last year said that, the, that the, the resurgence from the pandemic was going to be labor intensive, that actually new green energy, labor intensive, production of green green mm. environment environmentally aware industry i can't remember if it was one big conference yeah. about july yeah. and i remember listening and i was thinking labor intensivity is the argument that is thrown at arts and culture work all the time as its principal failure and the, the fact that we need to rethink efficiency one of the most labor intensive and energy saving the the, the best sustainable energy i should have said this when i was speaking but the best sustainable energy we have is humankind. So actually, if you think about it, if you produce a book, the best circular economy for a book is a public library. Mm -hmm. It's not a bookshop. It's not a PDF. It's not an Amazon reader. It's not a Kindle. It's a library. If you think about art as self-recreating and self-regenerating, actually getting up and performing every day is unique, all you need to keep that going is food and heat and love. And you don't need, you know, like, and if you can satisfy the basic, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you can satisfy basic human needs, you will have artists who get up every day and they will make music and they will perform and they will share and they will take kids into forests. One of the profound experiences of my early childhood, and I was brought up, luckily, in a very, very creative household, at about the age of five, I was walked around Cork City, which is my hometown, by uh, a then, it was an architectural historian called Pascal Keffert. And by that stage, he was quite old, and he used to wear a big Russian hat, and he took us out, and we were five, six, and seven years old, and he took us on a walking tour of the historic buildings of the city. And he kind of got lost track of time. <laughs> so, and we were, like, there were 50, it was an adventurous club on Saturday morning, and he went away. He was supposed to be back in two hours. There were 15 of us. <laughs> this one man, he was probably, he, like in my mind, he was ancient. He was probably actually in his late 50s. Or early 50s. <laughs> ancient. <laughs> and he walked us around the city. He lost track of time, but he stood by the city's walls. And the, you know, Cork has lots of rivers. And he said, the biggest worry is that one day all of these buildings will be lost. He said, they'll be lost like they'll be lost in Venice. And I was five years old. And this had this profound effect on me. And I had nightmares afterwards. But it also gave me this real love of buildings and protecting buildings. 
So this small little seed, it didn't have to be, he didn't have to do that for lots of people. And I don't know whether he ever did it again or how often he did it, but that moment, you know, our entire power is in these little moments of disconnection. Alan Lane, I'm going on a bit, but Alan Lane, who runs a company in England called Slum Low, took over a working men's club that was going to close, and he moved his theatre company, the Hall, I think the company was called the Hall, his company Slum Low, and the working men's club was called the Hallback, and he turned it into a community resource. So he was staging productions, he was doing promenade, he was doing community theatre, he was also doing quickling workshops. He was also having Indian curry demonstrations. He was also doing, running kind of like, and then during the, during the COVID crisis, he opened a food bank and he said, we weren't gonna make any more art while people are starving. And for the last year, he's been doing the craziest things. He's built an outdoor theater in a forest, only work using the resources of the local community. And to me, that's the power. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I think people should be doing, is actually stopping and kind of checking themselves and checking the values that they're projecting and thinking, what does this look like? What does this look like when everything I want you to do is driving you to spend money on me and not have me have an exchange with you? I think if I could just say something is that everything you said about the bureaucracy in the art world is multiplied many times over in the academy <laughs> in terms of how difficult it is to get anything new or different that even happened, even though we're supposed to be this place of intellectual curiosity and so on. You should also read Alice Huxley's book, Island, which is this kind of response to Brave New World. It's, I think it was a few months before he, before he died. It's more of a utopian rather than a dystopian piece. But for me, and it's, it's something that I've never been able to do in terms of going for research grants where I've applied for grants where I want to work with artists. I'd even ask my own head of school, can we not have an artist in residence, which I know some um, schools uh, in other parts of the world are doing in universities. And I know that can sound to tokenistic, but it is about seeing that, that very point you mentioned. It, this is not about art being the delivery mechanism of the sustainable message and so on, but actually, you know, we talk a lot about interdisciplinarity in the academy now, or as I like to call it, intellectual promiscuity. It's the only form of promiscuity that I think I probably could know. But often it's between you know scientists and social scientists and arts humanities are kind of mentioned, but there's never really a sense that well, I mean, what happens when you put a physicist and a poet together, or a dancer and an anthropologist or something? And I think that's the type of research and teaching that we need. You know, this is the very first time I've and Ali have actually met yet. We're academic colleagues here, um, and the university is not. In, the, in my mind, seeding this type of genuine interdisciplinarity where art and creativity and so on is not instrumentally viewed. That's how often, you know, research, um, where you do get, for example, a lot of research projects now will employ somebody to do nice infographics or do a you know, cartoon to represent their research findings. Now, you know, it's better than not, somebody's gonna get some hopefully decent wages out of it. But I think we're missing a lot of tricks in terms of bringing artists not as entertainment and, and there's academic workshops now where artists are brought in um, but they're not seen as part of the conversation you know they're not seen there as in their own right as creative workers offering ideas and i do think we need to you know challenge ourselves and this is not the problem of, of arts and creativity this is a problem with social science it's the problem with natural science is that it isn't seen in that way because for me you know, what we rapidly need to do is to move away from, it's Naomi Klein, I'm gonna quote here, great Canadian activist and author. We have a currently uh, an ecocidal extractivist economy that she calls a dig and gig economy. Uh, and that's part of the problem. And many of the issues that Ali was talking about, to how, you know, um, you know, almost like embedded carbon footprints because of the, the travel that's enforced on people and so on, it's simply reproducing that. And we need rapidly to get to what she calls a care and repair want, mm -hmm. in terms of both caring for uh, ourselves, and I really love the idea of relocalizing, you know, um, you know, art and valuing, you know, uh, our economy, because to me, selective deglobalization is gonna be an inevitable part of, as we go forward. We simply won't be able to, you know, um, uh, you know, engage in those forms of the exchange and trade of goods and services and travel. And the pandemic has showed us that. 
You know, when you have long supply chains, it's very easy to get, for them to get disrupted and so on. So for me, it is about saying, how do we include artists, not as a tokenistic bit at the end, as a delivery mechanism, but include at the start? It's almost like upstreaming. Uh, and, and in that process, can we then upstream citizens? Because most of academic research, even though it's meant to be for the benefit of society for the most part, although I have my doubts about some of my engineering colleagues far too close to industry and big corporates and so on. But um, we don't include citizens in, in, in the co-design of our research projects for the most part. Um, in the same way we don't include necessarily art and creativity, even though some of us, and um, might, might be a bit unusual in my field, where I do see the value of it, but I'm struggling to find what's the paradigm shift? How do we, how do, we do this? Because a bit like you're talking about um, and hailing us back to labor. Intellectual work is labor. Um, it's a privilege, there's no doubt about it, but there's a security of tenure and so on. But the institutional place we're in now is systematically biased against anything that's really disruptive. You've got to do things under the radar, in your own time, on top of the things you're already doing. It's not woven into the DNA of what we're doing uh, in, in the academy. Um, and that needs to you know, change. Ian, if you're watching, that's Ian Greer, our vice chancellor, when this is uploaded. Ian. You need to talk to Ali and, <laughs> and sit in that or stand in that box while you're having your next meeting. <laughs> There's an interesting um, quote I give my students every year when we talk about leadership. So, one of the things I do is talk about cultural leadership. And I'm a big fan of thinking about leadership. We tend to think about it as being a corporate thing, but it's, it's people who run organizations who do it as a behavior of inspiring people and creating innovation and ambition and that. And I tend to talk about, well, what about the leadership that's outside institutions, mm -hmm. outside organizations? People like you, it's kind of mm -hmm. like the idea of setting up a business to do something that is actually, it's not really about what you want to achieve, it's about something that's beyond you, mm -hmm. which is kind of one of the definitions of leadership. This guy called Graham Lester, and he just says that leadership is not, it's not about making the existing systems better or more efficient about fundamentally changing. It's not about tinkering at the, at the edges. And I think that that's the bit that um, I, I find fascinating watching the deprioritization of creative subjects purely as, as baseline, in the same way that PE or mm -hmm. something like civic studies or certain basic knowledges, yeah. that we're not teaching people to be citizens in school, we're teaching them to be employees. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not even teaching them how to be workers, we're teaching them to be employees which is such a different thing. And I find it very interesting that having spent decades working things out of an education system and commodifying and constantly moving towards this idea of creating good workers and good employees, we then spend probably millions and millions and millions of corporate dollars trying to create innovation and creativity in workforces. <laughs> and to me, there's something that's yeah. profoundly wrong. It's a form of kind of capitalist circular economy in and of its own <laughs> bubble. You know, I know for a fact that if we started doing some of talking some of these ways in a slightly different tone, you could go out and make quite a large amount of money as a corporate speaker. But that's not why we talk the way we talk. You know, it's yeah. you know, you could probably go and do away days for right. team building yeah. exercises. Get in the box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, build a house. Build a house in a day. And <laughs> um, you know and, I kind of, I get that, but that, that drive, it was, uh, I was, got very heavily involved. I trained in social enterprise. I set up a social economy business to help to finance a charity. And the direction we go down in is eventually you start to sell your soul. Mm -hmm. And you can fight it and you can resist it, but the main driver of it, I remember realizing, was coming from the public sector. Mm -hmm. And Northern Ireland is peculiarly dependent on the public mm -hmm. sector compared to other places. But the driver of the public sector was saying, make money doing what you're doing. Make profit mm -hmm. so that you can do the charitable work that we want you to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that it was so skewed in its, its thinking and its value that I found myself questioning, well, what is it we actually think is, is the definition of success? Mm -hmm. yeah. Andrew Taylor. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think the definition of success is to live a life where you're happy with what you're doing. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. To be comfortable and to live and, and be fully like the your values, your principles being followed through and how you earn and how you provide. And, but that's very difficult for a lot of people. 
Yeah, you know what I mean? I, I well, yeah, really it's, like, it's exactly what I did. Like, you know, yeah. like I like minimized as much as I could. And uh -huh. whenever I moved into the car, it was just like one car load that got me there. Um, uh -huh. And there was like, there was a big like element of this is this is me now, do you know? Like, and even just like at the start, like being like saying to people like, oh, I want to live in a tiny house. And they're <laughs> like, oh, okay. Like family and me didn't really talk at the start, but we're all on <laughs> terms now. Yeah. Um, but like, it's, it's hard. But then whenever you become that authentic, version you yeah. know and I am happy to talk about it like to, that it is just who I am but at the same time it's still not easy like I mm -hmm. like my rent is just the land rent because I own the pod but like it's very minimal so I'm able to do things that I want to do but you're still fighting systems you're fighting the yeah. arts council you're fighting and there's just not enough time and there's not enough support whereas I think like the and I'm doing a degree at Ulster at the moment in like business development and innovation and like this like they use this word like collaboration all the time and I'm like yeah I know, talk to the lighting designer as you're putting on the show. Like, don't bring them in at the last minute because that doesn't work. Yeah. And it's like, I feel like that's what we would do in the, in the politics room if we could get into like, it's just that, like, we make a show, we sell a show before we've really worked out what the show is. Like, that's what we're capable of. And mm -hmm. I think that that's something that's entirely overlooked. Whereas, like, the academia is all like research, research, mm -hmm. research, research. And the city councils, like, even working within this project, it's all very much like, oh, this has to happen, or this has to happen. And I'm like, mm -hmm. but if you're bringing in the creators, like, let us be disruptive. Like, yes. let us, like, you, like, that's what you're paying us for. Like, let us. Mm -hmm. Although, interesting, City Council have just done this thing where they are providing finance to 10 artists without having to produce something, mm -hmm. which is Fine. kind of a return <laughs> to a, a value yeah. system. And, you know, I, I, I suppose I go back to the point that I never went, I'm, I have never existed in a place that actually had free education. So I pay, you know, albeit nominally, my primary school was paid for, my secondary school was paid for, my university education was paid for. And that, you know, so I've never known what that was quite like. They eroded the National Health Service in the South of Ireland pretty much as I started to use it. So there is a kind of peculiar sense in which we have moved some, some of the golden age people talk about kind of certain kinds of policies of old labour actually didn't touch the sides when it came to other systems like the, the kind of constant reinforcement of the class system mm -hmm. the consistent kind of issues of kind of race mm -hmm. um but growing up in in ireland one of the things that i think still exists there is the idea that one can embrace a creative life without being forced to constantly produce something mm -hmm. to show that you are valuable mm -hmm. and i think that's where there's a big difference one thing I pick up on is the idea of being happy, though, mm. because I am of the opinion that if you are ever totally happy with what you're doing, you're that's probably the time <laughs> to stop doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, a, a, a good, yeah. a healthy dose of challenge is probably quite a good thing. Not too much, though. There's a question of what what do we think of a satisfaction, and one of the desperate things that turns up in cultural labour research all the time is this idea that arts and cultural people are they get the benefit of doing what they love for a living. Mm. That's exhausting. Mm. It's a total conceit. <laughs> it's so hard. It's a con. You're filling out applications that take hours to not yeah. know if you're gonna get the money. And even if you don't apply for funding, you're, it's a total con. Yeah. It's a total con that we have all allowed ourselves mm. to get trapped into by thinking, well, it's okay because I really love what I do. But it's no, not, it's not okay. I have to. Yeah, so many I have but to can I also, I don't do like, it. In terms of that, like, you know, I was I worked in the arts for ten years, and then it got to a point where it was like, I actually my mental health is gone because you're taking every like we were talking about it earlier. It's like, if I turn this down, I'm not going to get asked again, and then that's a stream of income that's gone. You know, so it's like, yeah. you can't do what you love because actually everything is about okay. So can I actually can I afford to pay my rent? You know, so it's this kind of like, what is the answer to that? You know, is it universal basic income for artists? Yeah. What is it? You know, like, it's that kind of thing of like... Well, yeah. that's, that, that, that's going to be happening next yeah. April down south. Yeah, but only for certain types of artists. And there's actually already real problems about the fact that it hasn't... It looks like it's, it's set up for failure. But there's a huge question for me is, why should artists have a universal basic income and not all workers? Yeah. So Everything. I think there yeah. are huge, huge yeah. challenges about kind of saying, well, you know, yes, I kind of think that artists do a special form of work. They mm -hmm. occupy a kind of public intellectual status. But do they have, should they have, if they have, if what they're missing is being respected as workers, does that not then mean that as well as having the same rights as workers, they should also then sit in solidarity with other workers? Yeah. So this kind of, it, it, cuts, it cuts both ways. 
but the problem of being a, unable to refuse to turn down work is um, is a really is a really profound problem that is deeply deeply bedded into this idea of um, the hierarchies we've created mm -hmm. and the systems of dependency. So artists are supposed to be free the definition of freelance mm -hmm. is that they're free. But they're not really. They're entirely entrapped by systems of patronage. So all we've done is replaced, you know, the Medici's and the Pope with state agencies and large cultural institutions who hire and fire you depending on whether you've offended them or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's I mean, I'm sounding so cynical. No, like it like I ended up leaving because I couldn't it wasn't sustainable for me. And I know like I did drama here, I graduated twelve years ago. And of my class, none of us are still working in the arts, mm -hmm. despite the fact that whenever we started, 50% of us went into the arts. Mm -hmm. Not one person from my class mm -hmm. of 30 odd people. But is that, is that a bad thing though? It, like it is and it isn't because that's the thing is like people wanted to do it and if they were making money or if they could live, they would be doing it. And that's the thing is, you know, they're some of the most creative thinkers you can get, you know, like, I mean, especially some of the like the people who work in stage management and things like they can do things that you're going I don't even understand how you've done that like you know technicians and things like that in theater you're going like you know I, I literally watch someone make it snow in a in a place where they're like I you know it's, you're just going I don't understand how this happens and it was literally like in a, a brick in the lyric theater in long gallery they they made it snow I don't know why <laughs> I asked him and he was like I still don't you know no, mm, yeah. you know, you're not allowed to tell no, secrets and stuff, really, but you know, it's like, real, like... There's a real danger, lots of special, yeah. lots of special skills, lots of hierarchies or skill sets. So junior positions are all gone, assistant roles are all gone, so where do people go to get thrown in? Yeah. And if you look at things like the death of music festivals, I think there's, there's, there's some connection to the loss of expertise and the loss of progressive careers and sustainable careers. I want to propose something to stir things up. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Andrea Montgomery, and I run a theater company called Terra Nova Productions, which will be 15 next March. Um, and uh, I think a lot about a lot of these issues, and I know Ali well. We're working on some some stuff together. I know many of you. So, at, and by the way, I don't necessarily believe what I'm going to say, but I want to put it into the room and see what people think. So. Don't do it. <laughs> In that artistic way, I'm ready to stir it. So. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the arts is that I think, and I, this is where we're looking at what the arts can contribute. I don't think it's about us nice artists going to schools. I'm sorry, I think some artists want to go to schools and that's great, but I think it's more than that. So one of the things I think that is really interesting is um, we want to move people from cons con consumption to experience. And I think uh, artistic experience is when they're good can be incredibly powerful um, like pilots for relearning the experience. That's one thing. And the other thing I think that is a huge issue for us is value shift. And I think that uh, art can be a place, a safe place where you can test values. So here comes my story bit. Um, so uh, about 10, 12 years ago, I started trying to get a project off the ground. Um, inspired by a particular thesis in one of Jared Diamond's books. Uh, it was called Collapse. Oh, okay. And I own Jared Diamond, lots of, you know, mm -hmm. suspect, we have major issues with some of his, his, his areas of discourse. But nevertheless, the uh, idea at the core of Collapse was the reason why um, societies in some closed systems versus societies in other closed systems, so you think of, you know, like, oases or islands or whatever survive and others don't is because um, the ones that don't survive have a particular set of values that they find important and they blossom and grow and fill that closed system based on those values and then they're unable to change their values so they can't change their behavior and therefore it collapses. And there was a really interesting story about a, a smallish island in the um, uh, in the Pacific, where they were able to kill their pigs. So pigs were, this is a Polynesian, so settlement of this island, a closed system. Pigs was the kind of, uh, the status currency, and you know, you if you wanted to be chief, you had to have you know more pigs than the other guy. 
And, but the pigs were destroying the environment, and so they actually got together and killed their pigs. So it's like us all agreeing to go and burn our Mercedes, basically. It, you know, and burn down our houses, and, and all the things which you essentially are in your tiny house, you know, you can imagine to try and get all of Belfast to make that journey. But this island did it because it was small enough, because they knew each other, because they could see each other, because the space was small enough. So they, uh, and, and so they shifted their values profoundly. And so one of the questions I ask myself as we talk about we should be employed and we should have funding and, and I, I believe me, I'm like, ah, I should have funding. So one of the things I ask myself is if the things that I value are, I believe that the arts are important, I believe that men and women are equal, I believe that uh, you know a healthy society has to have the poets in it, not out it, and, uh, unlike, uh, people in the Greek past. Um, if those are my profound values, is there a place where they are stopping me being willing to make the change that is required mm -hmm. for uh, us to shift our planetary systems into a better state? And so as artists, we tend to go, but art is important. Art matters. And of course, I can think of lots of reasons why it does. But surely if we're here in a room looking at the conversation about art and all those things in the context mm -hmm. of the climate crisis, we should be asking ourselves, what is re should are there places where we need to challenge even those most most profoundly held values? That's my question. Mm. I would say yes. 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 I think yeah. I think there's like there's so much in terms of like the the way that the systems are ran. Like even if you're talking about like the international stuff, like yeah. I was told by the arts council that if I wanted to get this particular type of funding, I had to have like a Look like a review in an international sort of paper, and I'm like, but how do I get that review? Because I don't think I have the money to make a piece that's big enough to get that review. You know, so it's kind of like and which may be in contradiction with my profoundly held values exactly. yeah. as a tiny <laughs> house dweller. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's so much, like there's so much that needs to shift before we get there. But I don't know, like, because but the anger and the passion drives me to make the stuff, and I think whenever you were talking, there was elements of being like, would I have like I was thinking. Yeah, I have to let some of that anger go. It'd be lovely to let it go. Like if somebody also says pushing. there will be no theater ever, and women will never be equal to men ever. I'm running away. But the, but <laughs> but you know whales will survive, and you know mm -hmm. puffins won't go extinct, and mm -hmm. and we'll have clean water, and then I'd be really oh you know um, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah yeah. But, but surely surely these are like pendulum swings that you know different kinds of artistic experience. Are like we we have been in situations where theater was banned. There have yes. been places where, you know, poetry was allowed. There's a brilliant, brilliant film um, about a uh, female punk band in Iran. I can't remember what it's called. It's called something like Cats. It's a brilliant film. I can't remember the title. But it is about the idea that, that as soon as something gets banned, it becomes the counterculture. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. becomes the alternative route. So people kind of whisper me. They hide poems. They yeah. they create things like street art. They create, you know, tattoos. They create codes. You know, and I I would stray into you know the mods, the punks, the the dandies, the queers. All of these different kinds of countercultural movements. These expressions of identity that have been banned yes. actually simply find their way out through the cracks and, and eventually become. <laughs> The mainstream, and then another tidal wave surge comes along. And but and what you're identifying with all the problems, the wicked problems, are elements of a value system that we need to abandon. Yeah. And it's it's giving up on the idea that we need to get the review in the Irish Times to yeah. be good, or giving up yeah. on the idea that we need to get the Arts Council grant to make our yeah. work. Yeah. You know, it's it's giving up. We have to, I believe. Yeah. yeah. That we have to break that system. Yeah. I also think that we have to recognize that um, certainly within, and this is where I keep going, within a country that has a public subsidy system, you know, and there are many countries which have cultural lives where the subject public subsidy system don't exist. Or Malaysia is pretty. Yeah. So there are, there are many, many ways in which people will seek the funding of a public body, not because they need the money, but because they want the status that is afforded. And it is exactly the same thing as people wanting, as I heard David Arditi talk about yesterday, talk about musicians wanting to get signed by the major record label. It is exactly the same driver. It is status 
-hmm. It is about endorsement. It's about sanctioning. You're good enough. You're because if you are a creator of work, sitting alone in the dark, making your work, what is your what is your frame that tells you that it's good enough? That's what they call the artist's reward. Sitting alone in the dark, not knowing if it's any good or not. <laughs> <laughs> the artist is existential crisis as well. Yeah. 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 Not, I mean, not necessarily. So, I, mean, I think I don't think it's a quid pro quo, you know. Um, but uh, I think that there are dangers. Like there are dangers for any kinds of, you know, any kinds of success brings, you know, value challenges. Um, but I don't think it's an absolute must. But I do think we are in a system. I, I, I think there is um, there is some interesting kind of stuff written about kind of the bohemian, the artist as a bohemian, yeah. which says that we've cultivated this idea that somehow artists have to suffer, that mm. you have to have a hard time making art mm. in order for it to be good enough. Starving and that's the yeah. Starving yeah. Starving yeah. That's entirely, it's, a, it's a 19th century construct. It didn't really exist in any way. It exists. Like, my yeah. daughter was paid loads of money. You just hit it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's his hopes, hopes and lords. <laughs> so this idea of patronage, the idea that somebody was paying for the systems of living, and actually the anti to that is the cooperative self-sufficient movement. So what's very, what's been very interesting, I went to a workshop in cooperatives a couple, about last year sometime, and these all sense of dates, I think, <laughs> up there the same so I can't tell you when, I think it might have been October, but there was, um, there was a, a woman called Tiziana Harper was doing workshops on cooperatives and setting up cooperatives, and I'm interested in these decentralized systems and how, because I'm thinking about what would it, what would an alternative ecology look like? What would an alternative cultural industry look like if we actually shifted where power was? And things like cooperatives and collectives cannot be free to go down. And she said that it was really interesting that cooperatives rose in on the island of Ireland post 2008 because the banks wouldn't lend people money to shut their businesses, so they were suppressed under prop under a healthy economy. They suppressed and when economy got lean, people turned to alternative systems. The left system that yep. was set up in England years ago, exactly the mm -hmm. same response. People trade when they hit poverty. During rationing during, after the Second World War, exactly the same. It was kind of invention is the mother of necessity. Necessity, necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> yeah. yes. It's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> but that idea of, of creating alternative systems and power, what's been interesting is if the state has a, an active role within arts and culture, the state also dictates the terms by which it trades. And if the state is seeking things like accountability and governance and value for money and efficiency, very often what it does is it suppresses risk, it suppresses these free, looser systems of organization. And very particularly what's happened over the years in the visual arts world, and there's Jane Morrow's research, who's been doing research in this kind of territory, is things like studio groups, collectives, artist collectives that deliberately resist having a leader, that resist having a fixed point of management, actually have been deprioritized and told that they're not meeting good governance principles. Mm -hmm. So we have a problem with how the state, in the pursuit of best practice, actually limits adventure and limits its innovation and limits this. And that's recognizable to anybody who works in the creative sector. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to get funded as an individual. Mm -hmm. Here, not in the South, not in England, not in Wales. Scotland, Scotland, Scotland you can apply for money as an individual. You don't have to set up a company. And actually, if you don't have to set a company, you can actually have far more time just mm -hmm. to do the stuff that you're gonna do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I find really interesting, is beer particularly has a very peculiar relationship with best practice. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> You also have a lot more bureaucracy. And it only flows in one direction. Yeah. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you got to play the game. It doesn't flow. There's no There's no checks and balances going back, and but with the best practice is flowing back out of that. Yeah. But, but I, I do think we have, a, we have a need to resist certain systems. Like, if the Irish Times won't re send reviewers regularly to Fermanagh or Donegal, mm -hmm. then at what point do we start looking for alternative systems? If... Uh, you know, if recording artists are giving up the idea of trying to get a record label to sign them or try to get reviewed in the music pages, what few music pages remain, 
then they turn to things like TikTok, they turn to YouTube, they turn to alternative platforms. So what are the ways in which you go round the mountain and just then demolish it from behind? I think the difficulty is that that's, that has happened, but now it, now the real issue is the, the rush to free, you know, the Spotify, the, that, you know, mm -hmm. it's, that model worked when there was still PRS and there were CD sales and, you know, mm -hmm. therefore you could get live gigs. Yeah, absolutely. But it's even, you know, a number of those things have now, yeah. it's streaming and streaming is free and. But also at various points, it has been the case that there weren't that many periods. There, there are relatively few people who work in the music industry who are musicians who are making who were making enough money that they were kind of it, the people who actually make lots of money are kind of very limited. The people who make enough to get by are more frequent. You can see more of them, but they don't necessarily. They're not a commonplace. The tendency is that you have a mixed economy. Yeah. You know, like you're. Yeah. I, I like hyphenate. Yeah, yeah. It's slash artist. I know. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it sounds kind of like yeah. vaguely Greek. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like hydrating. Are we like very yeah. London dairy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a yoga, yeah, whatever order. But in Crete, I think people were always doing that. If you think about, yeah. you know, I'm I'm fascinated by things like the sit ups movement that travelled around Ireland in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Entire families moved across the country every summer, and then they packed up and they stopped touring the winter because they, they couldn't go and perform in the church halls, but they played multiple shows, they carried stuff in repertoire. There's certain things around the, the obsession with premieres and mm -hmm. one night only mm -hmm. specials. And I love the one off experience, don't get me wrong, but there is a kind of a, a, an unhealthy attention to novelty mm -hmm. that is fundamentally unsustainable. So, mm -hmm. one of the first festivals I ever programmed was a show that was 25 years old. And they were still touring with virtually the same set. I mean, this was made of cardboard boxes. It was kind of easy. But this idea of a show that had simply aged and kind of matured, like I was like, well, gee. It was... They've been on tour a long yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the idea of something actually having life to it, yeah, yeah. I, find it the, I find that the energy that gets put into making work, mm -hmm. and it's the fact that it evaporates, shows disappear after yeah. a few weeks or because there's just not the funding to sustain them, like in terms of. But what? But surely there's an alternative model to it that says, well, actually, if we if we took funding out of it and we started to look at, say, mm -hmm. all the local authority venues that were built across the mm -hmm. 80s, the 90s, and the millenniums that are all now beginning to fall apart, that were in the interest of efficiency weren't properly built sustainably mm -hmm. because the green book appraisal mm -hmm. said it was too expensive. You know, all those buildings are they're programming on the basis that the work that comes to them already has a state grant. Mm -hmm. And we know that the state grant is not enough. Mm -hmm. So what's the new model that everybody has to get in the room together and come up with mm -hmm. that says, let's do it differently? Mm -hmm. That's what I want. Yeah, I want that model. Well, here, I don't know whether this is in the spirit of storing it or uh, reflecting, is that uh, time is very short. You know, it really yeah, is, is in terms of it, mm -hmm. it, it is, you know, it's almost like a, a, a major crisis, uh, a war type situation where it's clear and present danger. Values can take a long time to shift. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can happen quickly. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not against that. Uh, and I think we're going to need that because fundamentally, um, the climate crisis is a crisis of culture. Uh, really, yes, it has material issues of a rapacious capitalist system based upon endless growth, the commodification of almost everything. I mean, it, I was a local councillor and he said, slightly to distraction whenever uh, some cultural issue would come up and it was justified in the council report by how many extra bed nights were going to come out of it. And I'd be saying, you know, why is that the only rationale that we're, you know, this commodification of, of our, but my, my concern is the, is the time, is that if we're in a crisis, what does art in a context of a crisis look like in terms of Yes, it's practices that are unsustainable, it's like the university, that every system we have in society is unsustainable. Is that issue of, and I don't know what the answer is, in terms of, I, I think academia needs to change quite radically, just from my own experience in terms of speaking to where I am. I think we're dysfunctional as a university and a university system. We're not helping uh, this issue at all. We are producing at best technically competent barbarians in our management school, because I, I, I have a lot of opprobrium for 
economics profession of the most dangerous form of knowledge that we're propagating because it controls quite a lot of things. So I think the university system is completely broken. It needs to be completely remade. Um, but then it's that role of, well, what does art look like in the context of this mm -hmm. crisis? But the last thing I'd say is that, I don't know whether it's a happy or a negative thought, but there is a bunch of what they call themselves that are recovering environmentalists. These are people who say, well, fucked. Mm -hmm. It's too late. This sucker is going down. And they call themselves the Dark Mountain Project. You can go and look them up. And what's really interesting about this, some of the people I know, some academics, they were friends of the earth activists, and they you know, spent dedicate their lives to save the planet and, and do the right thing, and they said, it's, it's too late now. Mm -hmm. We should have started you know, 30 years ago. But what's interesting about this Dark Mountain Project is that it is profoundly aesthetically informed. It literally is gathering around the fire and howling at the moon as we go down. But, so I find it quite I feel like watching a car crash, you know, you should be looking at it, but it, it's fascinating. So for me, it's that issue of what is the role in the context of a profound and quickening mm -hmm. crisis where literally the planet is burning, you know, where these small degrees of increase from one, we're at 1.1 degree increase at the moment. The whole point was to stay at 1.5. It looks like at best, at best, we're going to get to 1.8. In reality, probably going to be about 2.7. I mean, this is absolutely um, unconscionable in terms of what it will mean. As a fun fact, the island of Ireland won't be so badly affected because we've got fairly low population density, a temperate environment. Well, as long as the Gulf Stream is yeah, cut off, if that, yeah. if, if that yeah. flips off, we have a, an ice age here. It is more the. Uh, I, I have no um, sense that humanity is going to disappear our species we're a pretty resilient tough species my real fear is that the transition will be too late we would have had these unimaginable horrors of thousands and thousands of people displaced by you know climate related disasters but what we'll do is we'll sacrifice our democracy all the cultural developments that issue you mentioned of uh, women's equality well you can see that quickly being that's a trade-off um is that we will sacrifice all these you know incomplete projects towards making our society and the world a better place because we're down to survival mm -hmm. that's what's really at risk here not not humanity which is why it always slightly irritates and oh save the planet the planet doesn't need saving mm -hmm. it's it can brush us off like a bad cold but it's all the things we will have lost culture progress mm -hmm. equality and so on because the reality is as the great um uh, jewish philosopher hannah Arendt said wonderful phrase she said the cry for bread will always be issued with one voice. And what she meant was the essence of democracy is pluralism, variety. You do not need democracy for survival. You do not need art, strict or you know, some of the things we're talking about for survival. And that's what to me is at stake here. Um, it's not the species as a whole, it's all the things you've created in this eleven thousand year period called the Holocene, mm -hmm. this period of grace. Of climate stability and as we leave that and enter this new radically destabilized world and of course we didn't get even to talk about those at the back of many of our minds particularly if you've got children and this is something we don't talk about at all in the academy at all about the fact that the current way in which academia is set up it's all just uh, you know rational head stuff and you know uh, i know some climate scientists who are clinically depressed Mm -hmm. clinically depressed and yet we don't talk about it and like, lots I, of artists are clinically depressed yeah, you know and I think it's something that we do I don't, I don't know what we do is it these small groups yeah, here I, I, ha I have to say to a certain extent I agree with you and then I actually think that there are, are there are chinks in the armour of certain <coughs> groups of academia the thing I, I kind of think about it is care manifesto oh. so the work of Joe Littler and James Keane Chuck Gaddafi the very small book. I'm, I'm a big fan of a manifesto. You know, not necessarily a political manifesto, but a state of life manifesto. And they mm. produce this thing called the Care Manifesto. And I think it's a fascinating, um, it's a fascinating proposition that says actually we just need to shift everything and think about care. Yes. Mm. Mm. So we we look at self care, mm. we look at kinship, yeah. we look at mm. we look at care economies and family yeah, yeah. care. And that this is a kind of a single, unique, yeah. and interconnected form. 
and yeah. that whole idea of, of flipping economy to serve society and mm -hmm. not society to serve economy, mm -hmm. that's the bit. And if that's what that is, then actually all <coughs> we need, all we need, is to actually, in the arts and cultural centres, get an arts and cultural feel that is in itself complex, messy, disparate, disconnected, caught up in its own inequalities, mm -hmm. to shift towards this flip. Mm -hmm. So how do you mobilise a group of people? I mean, I always think that it's amazing that the, the reason why arts and culture isn't a top priority in policy is because it is so disparate and it's made up of so many freelance mm -hmm. people who don't self-organise naturally. But whenever there was a crisis, like you were talking about crisis, yeah. Yeah. so I'd say that for us in the next 10 years, it's about seeing the crisis. We can't see it yet because it's the future is too far away. But if we knew that the crisis was here right now, which I know we're talking about verbally, but we don't feel, or we do feel, and we're depressed, and we're too depressed to do anything about it, that when are we going to get the, the freelancers in the room as politicians? Like, yeah, and also I think it's art form specific because I see people mobilise differently in different yeah. art forms. To me, the performing artists mobilise better as groups mm -hmm. than because some of the other art Because you can't do a play by yourself. Because even if you take <laughs> one when you play, someone has to put the lights on. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah. this idea of kind of like mobilising the yeah. temporary system, how do you do that? How do you harness that force? And how do you harness that force within communities? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I keep looking, I live in East Belfast, and I've looked at things like Rolf Artist Studios, mm -hmm. the original mm -hmm. Engine Room Gallery, some of the kind of bonkers stuff that got set up in Wallingford Community <laughs> Centre that led to the Nightlight Carnival, you know, all these kind of curious little movements and every now and then you kind of walk past and you see, you know, stuff sitting in people's bedroom windows and you think, oh, that's an art project. And somebody in the area has been making art for, for local residents, not because there's the permission to do it, but because they're just, they also are a resident. And this, this kind of, um, I actually think that we actually kind of need that sense of localization, of seeing who are the creative people in the community, who are part of a creative community, a cultural community, and not seeing it as this kind of complete separation of their own mm -hmm. parallel universe. That's kind of what we need to do to mobilize. Mm -hmm. um, also, like, there's something to be said about being part of the room. Like, one of, one of the most, like, one of the best pieces of um, art I've ever seen was um, Reassembled Slightly Askew, which um, I'm sure some of you have seen and stuff. But I always remember talking to Shannon about it, and it was, um, the fact that you know whenever she first talked about it with her surgeon so basically it was that you lay in a hospital bed with headphones on and it felt like the surgeons were talking about you and you had no agency so that was kind of the, the whole thing about it but I remember her saying like her her surgeon said yes yes you do that because that's what you need to do for your healing process and then whenever he heard it he said every surgeon needs to hear this mm -hmm. and it's you know it's that kind of thing where it's like actually getting people to to use their own creativity to make to influence higher things as well that it's not just about you know it's like like there's so many more things that can be done that it's not just about communities obviously that's a massive thing but it's also about the fact that like you know there is so many creative thinkers and like they they see things differently mm -hmm. and actually that's something that's needed within mm -hmm. the top level of society is like you know like I remember talking to someone who was becoming a surgeon about that piece of theatre and he was like, oh yeah, you know, it's, it's all just bullshit, you know, and I was like, you work in a theatre, but, yeah. but he, like, he just didn't get it and then I remember him actually going and doing it and he came down and was like, yeah, th you know, that really did change the way I see patients and it's like, you know, actually what could we be doing yeah. that's influencing Stormont, that's influencing Westminster, whatever else. Yeah, and whenever you were talking about the values and like how like, you can change the values, like I was like, I wonder if you could make like a multi-choice immersive theatre show if we knew what values we needed to change and we could put everybody in it and it could be like an escape room but you've got to get the right values to get out and then you come out and we say yeah, yeah. I, feel yeah. Bit, I feel a little bit hinky when somebody says the right values right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so maybe there's multiple options yeah and like multiple utopians and dystopians that you could end up in i also think that there's snatch. something and i know i've talked, <laughs> I think I've, I've thrown this conversation entirely into the pay for labor driven discussion of art, yeah. art and culture and there is I'm very conscious that you don't have to be earning a living from it to be an artist you know mm -hmm. that you know you can be you know, but you're doing little with everyone who's an artist that idea that there is intrinsic creativity in everyone and how do you make it but that's what you're describing is that human connection so it's it's mm -hmm. I talk to you I say go and experience yeah. this you go and experience this you're skeptical and then you have a creative experience 
the change of your mind, but you wouldn't have done it if somebody had said, go and do that. Yeah. yeah. You know, do that thing. And part of me thinks that we are very good at saying, well, how do we make something we can get everybody into? Mm. But, you know, we're it's sitting still in a word of mouth. With, with all due respect, we're sitting in a room and there's less than a dozen people turned up yeah. tonight. So yeah. maybe we're not always terribly good at actually think, getting outside our, our, mm -hmm. our bubble of influence and start thinking much more widely about, well, what are the connections we're making? How do we connect to people? How do they want to be connected with? You know, it's a two-way exchange. Yeah. What do they want to see mm -hmm. people make and work about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think what you were saying about reassembled site, Lucy, I don't know it. I haven't seen it, but I know Shannon and I know the story. And I think it's about empathy. I yeah. think that's what we do. I, think so it's 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 like, I work with Shannon's, actually, as her producing yeah. mentor on it. And the, the best quote she had was that it was an empathy injection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That it, it, it yeah. put empathy into you. Mm. Um, it's quite free. I don't know whether you liked it or not. Yeah. I mean, but they had to get them onto the beds with the, hear the headphones on for yeah. that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. This is I'm, I'm, I'm very different about something they are, because I can always kind of quote unquote, like, do this thing in Russia at a certain period of time and meet the central people the state and all those sort of things. So, how many, how many artists would, 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 would um, have been able to do that? I mean, there's a long, long history. I mean, um, Penn International as a movement is committed. And Amnesty has the, what's it called? Amnesty have a Life power. This, they have a, oh, I can't remember. Yeah, there's some particular program yeah. which is which is about writers who've been put in prison. I mean, Ken Tarariwa was one of the. It's the right for rights. I, I am not somebody who, I make quilts. Sure. So, <laughs> I would leave that for people yeah. who actually make well, so, uh, well, uh, Andrea, if you, if, you, if you put a play on, and someone said, like, Andrea, that play's not being performed, they were in prison for two years, would you come out and create another play? Um, um, I think that if you have the creative impulse, yeah. it will come out somewhere. Uh -huh. um, and I would say that it's never, it's never as black and white as that. There's all kinds of shades of grey. Um, about... Um, Oh my God, it was 2012, I think it was, 2013. I put on a play, it was a puppet piece um, called the Ulster Kama Sutra that had singing knitted <laughs> vaginas in it. Um, it was a great play. And it was really interesting because I could not, I, I could not get it, play. could not get it toured. It was so difficult. And when I could get it toured, I couldn't get the photograph published. Um, so uh, there's, I don't want to go to prison. Yeah. Well. So the answer for me is, no, thank you. Well. If somebody said to me, I, you're gonna go to prison, I'd be like, I think I think maybe I okay. won't do that. Um, but I was willing to put singing vaginas on stage. So <laughs> <laughs> there's I think it's down the boundaries. How far and there's all kinds of little nudges and how far are you willing to go and are you willing to stir the pot and and then you discuss, ooh, is this a point where I need to shut up? And at some points they say yeah. yes, and other points they say no. And there no. are other forms of transgression and sending yeah. into pr pr prison is kind of like a little bit of a, you know, all or nothing. It's a really easy to say no to. But there's, I don't want to go the, you know, the withdrawal of funds, the yeah. the mm -hmm. protests outside we, yeah. theatres. We had that. Yeah. 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 So we did a show called Night for the North about yeah. reproductive rights. And we did it in the lyric and there was no fuss. And we did it in the Mac and we put up a poster in Lab Race. And there was a massive kick off of it. And um, if, like, it was really stressful, like really stressful, like coming down to the show, coming down. Had, I did like a, again, the yoga, like, so I did like a relaxation with all my artists because we're so, it, the shows are, everybody's in every room, so the actors don't actually see each other during the show, but we're all in this world together, so I need to like, create a moment of collectiveness. And then when we all came down to do our spaces, there was protesters outside the Mac, and I was like, oh God, we don't have budget for security, what do we do? And the police had to come down and like, keep them outside the building, and it was really stressful. Mm -hmm. The Mac loved it because it was like, a bit of, you know, a bit of... Free for edgy. edgy. Yeah, edgy. it was edgy, it was edgy. Yeah, yeah. My mental health did not love it. But again, we knew exactly what we were getting into, and that was in 2019. So everything in those sort of reproductive rights conversations, like politically, was very high. And um, yeah, I'm going to... But you know, if, if you go right there. back to the, yeah. the foundation of the Irish state, you have the deliberate suppress, the introduction of extreme censorship laws mm -hmm. that restricted the ability to do anything but criticise the church on mm -hmm. stage, yeah. There were, and what happened was playwrights started writing allegories. You know, they started writing stories that were not of the stories that they wanted to tell, versions of the stories. And you, you know, you go back into 
you know, restoration drama. They are telling the stories of the politics of the day, but they're just not telling it mm -hmm. straight. But our problem right now in our country is not that people don't want us to tell climate change stories or climate chaos stories. It's that it's that they're not necessarily interested or they're turned off, and it's how do we bring them in? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what little breadcrumbs do we put down so that we can then have the empathy? Yeah. I think we, we should just go and ask them. Uh, yeah. I think we just go and talk to our neighbours and we go and talk to the people that, you know, like, it's it's not necessarily for us to come up just with the solution. Absolutely. I totally agree with and tend to develop shows that way, as we mm. know. Um, but it's interesting to even want, therefore, then it jumps, you know, who wants to talk to me? Uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. Particularly yeah. in the context where some people can't even think about the end of the world when they're thinking about the end of the month. Yeah. The issues of profound issues of class yeah. and privilege and so mm -hmm. on, yeah. uh, which I think we all, you know, we all, we all, we all recognise. But I like that idea of, you know, um, going and, and talking. We definitely need more discussions like this. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And the box has been good. Like even to see people yeah. walk past the box today and people being like, oh, "What the hell is that?" and like yeah. having a conversation. Um, yeah, I think it's been interesting. Yeah, well. in 20, 2015. Uh, we staged a series of community dinners in a pop-up unit when I was running a festival. And we staged a series of dinners. We, we, got, we got given a retail unit in Catholic Court Shopping Centre, which we lived in. We kind of put on exhibitions and events and we lent it to people as a creative space. And it was there for about two or three years, I think, in the end. Um, but we did this one thing where for late night shopping, every Thursday night for about a month, we put on community dinners and we called them Food for Thought. And 40 people came. And it didn't matter who, who turned up. We didn't actually, nobody booked tickets. Mm -hmm. We didn't put a limit on the door. Somehow 40 people, we had 40 seats at the table and we always ended up with 40 people and we never turned anybody away <laughs> and we never knew who was coming. But at any one time, we ended up with this weird combination, but we constructed it almost like a formal performance where we had two actors playing kind of mother and father and we constructed the dinner table to be in such a way that they had to share food with each other. So they weren't given a plate of food. They had to feed each other. They had to pass stuff. There was lots of stuff about sharing bread, you know, that kind of thing. And the whole thing was designed to keep people sitting at the table to have a discussion about what it meant to be home, to be fed, to share stuff with family, with friends, whatever that meant for them. And we did that, and then we did another version. We, and we gathered all these like responses that went up on the wall. And at a certain point, we did the same dinner. And this time, we had images all around the walls of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And we were looking at cultural rights, but we also were looking at uh, child poverty. And we had the Children's Commissioner, we had people from the Arts Council, we had people from the City Council, people from the Food Bank, we had various different kind of uh, MLAs, but they were all there off duty. So we weren't having a conference, we weren't having a meeting, we just said, just come and, just come and break bread with us. Mm -hmm. And 40 people sat around the table, and at the end of it, they stood <coughs> up and said, I remember Kula and Yusun were saying, so I've, all these people I've met at countless conferences mm -hmm. and I've never had a conversation like the conversation we had tonight. Mm -hmm. So we simply put the conversation in a different location mm -hmm. and we used things, without pointing on the walls, we used things that had little question prompts. We just pushed and pushed and pushed in that kind of subtext. I'm not saying it changed the world, mm -hmm. but it certainly changed the conversation enough that something else started to happen. And those kind of world building skills, which we use to make plays, yeah. can be used. Yeah. That's a, maybe a, okay. a, a point. To, uh, so, skills. next time we're going to meet and break bread and have wine. Build worlds. Not tables. Sorry? Build worlds. Yes. Like this, that. So, yeah. so, thank you all for, for coming to stay safe and socially distant from the audience. <laughs>